in the old days, we would have thought this would have had thousands of people at it. It would have been an incredibly important meeting. But as we're about to take a decision which could affect our economy by between 6 or 9% GDP a year, ah, um, it feels as though this is um, a minor consideration perhaps compared to those. But indeed, it is an extremely important decision. Um, the relationship between, for example, setting the interest rate on all of our mortgages and all the other important macroeconomic and day-to-day um, -day decisions which the Bank of England makes decisions on. I would really like to thank Fran, who is a wonderful um, leader in this field, and the work of Positive Money, which is a fantastic member-based organisation and which is a really good resource for members of parliament who are not necessarily experts in the economy but who take an interest in how the economy affects the lives of their constituents. So I would really like to extend a thank also, thanks also to our brilliant report writer, um, who is going to speak to the report briefly, and um, called Seeking, Seeking Legitimacy, which is a great title. And um, I'm looking forward very much to digesting all of this in between votes this evening. Um, with no further ado, I'm going to pass over to Fran, who's going to talk about um, how we're going to proceed today. Thank you, Fran. Thanks very much, Catherine, um, and thanks all for being here. Uh, it's an early start, and um, obviously there was quite a queue to get in. Uh, so I'm Fran Voigt, I'm an Executive Director of Positive Money, and today we're launching uh, the report, Seeking Legitimacy in New Settlement with the Bank of England. Um, we've already had some good coverage in the press, uh, and obviously we feel like this is a, a really important um, topic and quite a timely report, um, seeing as we're on the verge of appointing a new governor of the Bank of England who will serve an eight-year term uh, and already in the decade since the crash the economy and what the Bank of England does looks quite different and in the next uh, eight years to a decade we've got obviously quite a lot of challenges coming our way um, whether that's climate change inequality and how we make uh, the UK economy better serve um, people and uh, the domestic economy. So, I mean, what's happened since the crash is obviously the kind of failure of central banks to predict the crisis resulted in them grappling with a kind of legitimacy crisis. So, the kind of orthodox model of, of central banks began to disappear somewhat. And um, as well as that, central banks were given new responsibilities, an important one, which you know, we would applaud is financial stability and alongside that uh, they're given new tools some of which are kind of complex and to a degree shrouded in confidentiality um, and at the same time monetary policy was given new um, tools as well uh, including quantitative easing um, which obviously had significant distributional effects and there was some controversy over that and some doubts in its effectiveness so what we're trying to do with seeking legitimacy isn't um, isn't simply trying to kind of talk about the policy tools, which that for those of you that have followed Positive Money for the last um, seven years will know we talk a lot about and how we could use new tools to um, stimulate the economy. We're looking at the institutional arrangements. Something we've been advocating for a long time is the need for increased monetary and fiscal policy cooperation. Um, and so here we and set out some specific ways to do that uh, and kind of start the conversation on implementation because we do see that as being a huge barrier to getting this um, conversation moving you know if you go to the Bank of England they'll say oh no that's the Treasury's role if you go to the Treasury they'll say that's the Bank of England role and now we've got the industrial um, strategy in there as well so we think that actually these powerful macroeconomic institutions need to all be working together for a direction um, of the economy. So we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers. Um, Rob is our is the lead author, Rob Bacori, of Seeking Legitimacy. He was an economist at Positive Money, we sadly lost him earlier this year. He works now as an analyst at the Climate Policy Initiative. Um, we have Sir Vince Cable, who's the MP for Twickenham, served as leader of the Liberal Democrats, between 2017 and earlier this year. He was the Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills for five years during the coalition government, during which he created the world's first ever green investment bank. And he's currently the Liberal Democrat spokesperson for health and social care. We have Ian Blackford, the leader of the SNP's Westminster Group. He's served as MP for Ross Sky and Lockerbie since 2015. 
and has repeatedly questioned the effectiveness and side effects of the Bank of England's quantitative easing programme and secured the first ever Commons debate on the topic in 2016, which we were very pleased about, so thanks for doing that. <coughs> we have Robert Skidelsky, uh, a professor emeritus of political economy at Warwick University, and his book, Money in Government, A Challenge to Mainstream Economics, was published earlier this year. It was a very good book, and why we brought him onto the panel. Uh, he was a former Conservative Treasury spokesperson, and he now sits as a crossbencher in the House of Lords. And we're also expecting um, Clive Lewis, who's the MP for Norwich South since 2015, to join us. And he currently serves as Labour's Shadow Treasury Minister for Sustainable Economics. Um, before entering politics, he worked as a journalist and BBC reporter. And we've had apologies from Ros Altman, who is a Conservative peer, his life, um, and unfortunately due to the significant activity in Westminster, she wasn't able to join us. So we're not as quite as full um, cross-party as we hoped, but we're doing quite well, we think. Um, so we're going to kick off with um, Rob, we're going to hear from all the panellists, and then we'd really <coughs> love you to be part of this discussion as well, because we know there's a lot of thinking in the room. Thank you. <coughs> Clive, come and sit down front. Well, I'm happy here, but I'm just keeping control of things in the room. You'll be in charge soon. <laughs> 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 um, I'm going to have to say in advance, I've got quite a soft throat, so you're going to have to forgive me that. But, um, thanks very much, everyone, for being here for such an early start. Um, I just want to outline uh, the reasons we should have for writing the report. Um, and the main areas that we consider to achieve um, what would be a, a turning point in accountability and legitimacy for the bank of England. Um, I haven't got control of the slide. I do. Okay, excellent. Um, right, so our current economic institutions um, are not really fit for purpose. We're in a disinflationary world. Only this week, Mervyn King, the former Bank of England governor, spoke about ongoing stagnation that central banks have little in the toolkit to address. So there's a productivity crisis in the United Kingdom and abroad, and that's twinned with a financial sector which favours extractive rather than socially useful activity. Central bankers aren't really responsible for finding themselves here. There's government austerity exactly when it was least useful. Left central banks as the only game in town, is a popular phrase. So they've been forced to choose between failing to meet their mandates and taking extraordinary action through policies like quantitative easing that are poorly understood and immensely unaccountable. And because they're so overstretched, crucially, central banks currently lack monetary space to respond to the prospect of another crisis. So this is for practical reasons, with policy interest rates at a much lower level than when the 2008 crisis hit, but also political ones, in the central banks are nearing the nar narrow limits of the legitimacy that's sparsely afforded to them by the orthodox model of central bank independence. So positive money has worked for several years, doing great work to highlight these shortcomings. And we've said many, many times that a serious response will require more radical policies. It's clear that change in that direction is coming. On the left, there's new economic thinking. The Labour Party has commissioned high-profile reviews of the Bank of England's mandate. But an appetite for change also exists among the guardians of the, the former guardians of the establishment. You see pointed reflections like these in um, pages of the Financial Times and The Economist quite regularly. And very interestingly, BlackRock Investment Institute, which is the asset manager's research arm, published a study this August, which claimed that unprecedented policies would be needed to respond to the next downturn. It proposed a soft form of coordination between fiscal and monetary policy, <laughs> and I'm quoting, a, via a standing emergency fiscal facility, which is quite remarkable to be the American that. Um, but these kind of radical policies must not be implemented without very strong provisions for accountability. <coughs> the question is to ensure that what emerges enjo enjoys deep social and political legitimacy, but are also being effective. So that's the goal of the paper um, we wrote and that's being launched today. Um, it draws on some academic theory, but also makes practical proposals uh, that refer to the current model of the Bank of England's independence, so as to be workable but also to accommodate policies radical enough to fix the problems we face. And the research was conducted over several months in exchanges with former senior officials from the Bank of England, 
um, other academic experts in central banking and engagement, um, positive money's engagement writ large with, uh, with Parliament's scrutiny of the bank's work. And from that process, we identified some key areas for improvement and accountability, uh, which I'm going to run through. Um, and some of these have been identified and developed by the bank itself, to give it credit. Um, and there we've encouraged further progress. But in others, a critical distance from the institutions uh, helps see a route forward. So three of the areas concern the arrangements uh, which are used to shape how the bank makes decisions and how they're, and the oversight of those decisions. The first goes right to the heart of the question of who makes these decisions. Um, we looked at the process of appointment to the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee, Financial Policy Committee and Prudential Regulation Committee. Now appointments to these key decision-making bodies, and in particular those which govern financial regulation, involve a worrying reliance on the financial sector to source candidates. And moreover, in the UK, secrecy has too often characterised the hiring process producing, naturally, rife speculation in the media. Which all means that Parliament, via the Treasury Select Committee, cannot exercise proper scrutiny of nominations without risk of a scandal, as in the case of Charlotte Hobbs' resignation. Now, examples from other countries can guide us here. So the Swedish Riksbank solicits suggestions from groups in wider society, aims for an even balance of men and women in a long list of 10 to 15 individuals, which are narrowed down to about three or four the final selection. And so to make a critical improvement in transparency of the Bank of England's process, it's down to the Chancellor of the Exchequer who ought to publish openly both the details of the application process and the reasoning for selection, and also the shortlist of candidates for scrutiny <coughs> by the Treasury Select Committee before the point of maximum tension. And the second area we considered was dialogue, quite broadly, between central banks and legislators themselves but also, more recently, a direct channel of communication between central banks and the public. So, on the one hand, hearings for bank committee members before the Treasury Select Committee are crucial, but too often present a one-sided reflection of the bank's official opinion on a policy matter. So these hearings, we say, need to be bolstered by a regular call for evidence from civil society and academic academia, but that should also extend to the bank's regular inflation and financial stability reports as much as the uh, irregular inquiries into particular issues. And the bank also has a new initiative for citizens' panels. That's a welcome innovation. It's where senior bank officials can engage with members of the public. Um, they can gather information about the effects of its policies and improve societal understanding and trust in their turn. So these, this institution should be expanded, made fully transparent. We also propose that could be linked to parliamentary inquiries by, publish it, by published summaries of the evidence Receives. The third area concerns what happens during economic crisis, which is often said when decisions really count. So due to the emergency nature of a recession, QE and other massive interventions in financial markets were born during a period where democratic institutions were relatively unable to exercise meaningful scrutiny. But that should be no excuse for avoiding retrospective scrutiny. The bank has published information on the distributive impact of its monetary policy, but only after coming under pressure to do so, and naturally, its analysis will also be marked by, self, by institutional self-interest. So crisis policies demand full examination by independent experts where possible, so we can learn, improve, <coughs> and avoid repeating the same mistakes as a society. Now, those massive monetary policies were more extreme than perhaps they might have been, because of fiscal austerity. So, in a sign of the quite remarkable times that we're currently in, we can see positive money agreeing with BlackRock and pushing for a mechanism grounded in firm principles for fiscal policy to coordinate with monetary policy. And the parameters for that institutional arrangement must be established before the next crisis, before it is too late. And in one fourth and final area, we go outside of the current arrangement of the bank to look at the broader question of purpose. So fundamentally, to address the UK economy's difficulties at this time, the bank's tools of governing and shaping the banking system are going to be pivotal. A massive spike in regulation following the financial crisis really addresses the symptom but not the cause, that is, a hugely concentrated private banking industry 
incentivize to lend to existing assets rather than building new societal prosperity. So correcting this will require more than the bank alone can offer, but also more than it should be tasked with deciding alone. So that's why we recommend finally that the government create a commission to establish a policy of credit guidance in the UK, where the bank would work in tandem with government departments under their instruction to achieve more political goals, such as a stable reduction in house prices or an improvement in business lending, both of which we sorely need. And that's the future, if actually also in many ways the past of monetary policy. So that's an overview of what's in the report. I, of course, recommend reading it um, to engage with it in greater detail. Um, the overarching point is that all of these areas have to be complementary. We need a comprehensive overview and plan for the UK's monetary regime to meet economic challenges and the political crisis we face simultaneously at the moment. Thanks for your attention, and I'm delighted to hand to our excellent panel. Thanks so much, Rob. And I'd love to hear from uh, Professor Robert Skidelsky now. Okay. Thank you. Well, I, I suspect we'll all be singing from roughly the same hymn, sh hymn, hymn sheet um, this morning. Um, the basic point is that um, the theory of macroeconomic policy is a mess, and um, no coherent theory now exists. Uh, fragments of pre crash orthodoxy still linger, together with increasing calls for fiscal input, which um, reflect uh, both the disappointment with monetary policy um, uh, um, uh, with, in the last 10, 15, 10, 12 years, and also the expectations of a new recession um, for which we're unprepared. Uh, but no clear idea exists of how fiscal and monetary policy are to be coordinated to prevent um, recessions and to deal with them when they occur. Uh, this is because pre-crash orthodoxy abstracted from the possibility of these sorts of recessions. And that is, so it's at the level of theory, from the level of theory, that we need to think about the institutions. And, pre, and then why did pre-crash orthodoxy develop? Because that in turn was a real response to the breakdown of the Keynesian macroeconomic constitution of the 1970s, succinctly stated by Nigel Lawson, in his May's lecture of 1984, and I quote, uh, it is the conquest in, of inflation and not the pursuit of growth and employment which should be the objective of macroeconomic policy. This wisdom came to be embodied in the idea of independent central banks being mandated to achieve price stability and given one tool, interest rate policy, uh, to achieve it. And that was the whole of macroeconomic policy. Yeah. Everything else was unnecessary. Now, at root, the conviction that political management of business cycle um, at the behest of vote, a vote, vote uh, catching politicians was the cause of the problem. I mean, it was to get politicians out of the business of macroeconomic policy that the independence of the central bank was created and its very limited target um, uh, uh, in introduced. Um, so <coughs> the, that kind of thinking reflected the triumph of Milton Friedman. Uh, and, and Milton Friedman believed that in the absence of inflation, the macroeconomy would be stable. And therefore, there was no, no need for more extensive um, government intervention. In short, the only macro policy needed was monetary policy. And fiscal policy was to be passive. It was to support the Bank of England's mandate by running budget, uh, balanced budgets. The only issuer of money in this sort of, uh, in this uh, new constitution was to be the central bank itself. And therefore, it's obvious that there couldn't be any monetary financing of the deficit. Um, in fact, all, all, any deficit um, uh, should not involve the creation of new money. However, the, um, trans this transfer, uh, this outsourcing of responsibility for macro stability to central banks entailed a huge uh, transfer of power 
from elected governments to un from elected uh, government to unelected technicians. Uh, formerly, the technicians were accountable to government and parliament, but paradoxically, their credibility depended on them not being accountable to government and parliament. And that is the problem at the heart of the proposals you made. I mean, if you, um, if you um, start appointing socially um, uh, necessary people, if you like, we want to put it that way, to the Bank of England, then what effect does that have on its credibility? Its credibility now depends partly on the fact that all the people who were in it come from the city. That is, that is, that is precisely the point. And I don't know how it would work exactly if you started widening the membership um, to people who are non-expert in debt management and the technical problems um, which are connected with monetary policy. Um, so, we, we may say that this lack of accountability doesn't, w wouldn't matter so much if, new, if, if the new policy, the orthodoxy, had turned out to be successful and politically neutral. But of course it did neither. First of all, um, and very importantly, it <coughs> couldn't prevent the collapse of 2008, the point already made, um, uh, and quantitative easing could not bring about anything like a robust and durable recovery. In fact, what the crash revealed was the weakness of monetary policy. Um, and this is something Keynes pointed out many, many years. We're always trying, having to reinvent old wisdom as we go along. Um, um, and, 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 and especially in 2008, 2009, it was clear that um, the bank, the central bank bailout, bailouts were part of fiscal policy. They were guaranteed by the taxpayer therefore they weren't monetary policy. And the second point is, it's not true that monetary policy, this is a point you made, not true that monetary policy is neutral, political ne politically neutral. It has distributional effects. Um, um, and, and these, uh, the way it's been uh, practiced in, in the UK has been on the whole to benefit the rich. And that's why, um, that's the rationale for that now forgotten um, call by um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn for people's people's quantitative easing. Do you remember way back, he, he was very was very much influenced by the distributional consequences of the way QE had actually been uh, happened. So my bottom line is the question of bank accountability can't be addressed separately from the theory of macroeconomic policy itself. If the Friedman Lawson view of the macroeconomy is right, then the issue wouldn't arise. If it's wrong, as I believe events have shown it to be, then the focus needs to be on the requirements for macroeconomic policy and the institutional changes which are contemplated have to be in that context. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And I have to say, I find myself agreeing with just about everything that Robert had to say, albeit coming from an island in Scotland, we would be sitting from a sand sheet rather than a hidden sheet, <laughs> be, that, be that as it may. But I mean, this issue, I mean, you made reference, Fran, to the debate that we had in, in Parliament in 2016. And the reason that I called for that debate was because I'd put down a number of written questions, a number of oral questions to the Treasury uh, questioning the effectiveness of monetary policy. And frankly, I was getting nowhere. And the reason I was getting nowhere is because the Chancellor of the Exchequer and his team were effectively able to say, nothing to do with us. This is a matter for the Bank of England. And that, I think, addresses the, the, the point that, that you made, Robert, about the elected politicians having passed responsibility to uh, unelected technocrats. And it's really quite extraordinary when you, just as you've done, you've discussed the distributional effects of this. And I recall from the Bank of England report into this in 2013, and if I remember rightly, I think the top 5% of society has benefited on average to the tune of £84,000 at that point. And when you put it into context that what happened, I remember the day that the QE programme that was announced under Gordon Brown, the 19th of March 2009, and you can actually see that the, the FTSE 100 dropped at that point. So we've seen a remarkable increase in the value of 
financial assets in the period since then. The stock market, which has increased by 70 odd percent, yet over the course of the last decade, the real wages have declined. So that is another the issue. That what we've done, in effect, with quantitative easing, we've rewarded those that were responsible for the financial strategy. And those that have paid the price of that are ordinary folk. And I do wonder, in the context of that, if we wouldn't be in the mess that we are with Brexit today, if we hadn't made such a hash of the recovery from the financial crisis way back in, in 2008. It really is quite extraordinary. And I think for anybody looking at this, it's that disconnect that we have between monetary and fiscal policy. And I've seen very little analysis over the course of the last few years of what the effect of QE has been in particular on M4. And I think it's something that we need to do to discuss the effectiveness of that. But I have to say, when I was listening to, to Rob and talking about credit policy as well, but there is another factor that I think we do have to consider in this, and that's the interaction between credit policy and the provision of capital. Because one of the one of the hindrances that we have in the UK is the lack of access to capital for growth. Um, the banks historically have never invested in that, and that's one of the reasons why in Scotland, for example, that we're establishing a, an investment bank through the government, because it's the, the lack of that development capital, which is a, a very, very considerable factor. Look, I, the, the report that you've done has to be welcomed, and we need to make sure in this debate that we're having that we have that political accountability, and in particular the role of the Treasury Select Committee has to be uh, addressed in, in all of this. But there are other factors, I think, when you consider that interaction between uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy and indeed taxation policy, because you can't exclude that from this debate as well. And I'm minded by a, a report that, that Andy Haldane, that a report, that a, a speech that Andy Haldane gave at a, a corporate finance conference at Edinburgh University. And he was looking at the use of capital of US corporates from the 1960s up till I think it was around about 2015 at that point. And what struck me that way back in the 1960s, the 10% of the free cash flow of US corporates was going to the share buybacks and dividends. By 2015, that had risen to 66%. It's little wonder that we're not delivering sustainable economic growth when corporates are returning cash to shareholders to the extent that we are. So taxation policy has to be a factor that looks into this as well. It's not monetary policy, it's not fiscal policy. It's a whole gambit of policy responses that, that, that has to be looked at in the, in the round and all of these things. But I have to say that I really do welcome the report. It's a, an important contribution to the debate. But I want to, when I finish on this, when we come back to the debate that we had in, in the Commons in 2016, Vince, unfortunately, was temporarily out with Parliament, and I'm sure he would have been in that debate. But if you watch that debate file, as I'm sure you did, I think there were only six MPs that participated in that debate. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to commend those that did speak, because I can remember the contributions all very clearly. Steve Baker, who was then a government, uh, on the government side as a backbencher, but Helen Goodman from the, from the Labour side that spoke with uh, great intellect on the issues as well. My uh, colleague, George Kennedy, who used to in fact be my monetary economics lecturer, but the scale and the breadth and the width and the depth of contributions were solely limited. And we had a government minister that summed up the debate that, quite frankly, didn't know a single thing that he was talking about. Mm -hmm. It was one of the most depressing experiences that I think I've ever had. And the fact that so few members of parliament were prepared to enter into the chamber, never mind participate in the debate. And I'm afraid to say that when you say quantitative easing to most members of parliament, you'll find that their eyes will flip over. So there's a hell of a job to be done to make sure that there's a, a proper understanding of the, the issues which have such an effect on the lives of all our institutions. Uh, um, I largely agree with what's being said, but perhaps I can stir up a bit of complacency and uh, <laughs> defend some of the things that have happened. I made my maiden speech in this place in 1997 in support of Gordon Brown's decision to make the Bank of England independent and in parallel to create a set of fiscal rules. I thought it was a very big advance in policy and it remains relevant. And if you wonder why it's no longer relevant or why it is relevant, look at the United States. A few weeks ago, um, 
four ex governors, uh, ex uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve, have to speak up because Trump <coughs> is renouncing the current Federal Reserve as a bunch of boneheads because they refuse to manipulate interest rates to help him get reelected. And that, in a nutshell, is why <coughs> operational independence by central banks is important. And it's what used to happen here. You know, politicians used to play with interest rates to help get reelected. That's why we set of rules. And although Robert, of course, is quite right that you know, there were major deficiencies in the response to the financial crisis, the simple truth is that active monetary policy, whether it's orthodox or unconventional, did help prevent a slump developing, particularly successful in the United States, but here and elsewhere. Uh, and of course, there have been nasty side effects notably the pumping up of asset values, particularly property. But the fact that that's happened is, is, is down to the failure of government rather than central banks. I mean, if we really worry about inequality and wealth, well, we should be taxing houses. Uh, politicians won't, of course, because it's quite a set amount of political courage. But, you know, blending monetary policy and central banks is, <coughs> seems to be perverse when they've done largely what they were supposed to do. There have, of course, been a big failure in economic policy, and I would agree with some of the critics of the coalition that I was part of. We had an argument raging behind the scenes at the time. We should have borrowed a lot more money at low interest rates to invest. It was a big policy failure. <coughs> but that was a failure of government, of the Treasury. It wasn't mm -hmm. a failure of the Central Bank. And if we look at the last few years, one of the most important interventions of the Bank of England uh, was the day after the referendum. <coughs> and it's galling, actually, that all these Brexiteers say Brexit isn't a problem because look what happened after the referendum, nothing happened <laughs> except a big devaluation. And that was largely a successful intervention by the Bank of England, which we all uh, took for granted. So looking backwards, <coughs> uh, I don't think a sustained attack on um, the current framework of monetary policy is justified. But looking forward, just two points, really. I mean, first of all, is the present structure equipped to identify future risks and dangers? Well, I, I, I don't know what would be better. Uh, the current governor was quite courageous in pointing out the dangers around stranded assets in the energy sector, for example. Um, quite far-sighted, I thought. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, the Bank of England, <coughs> together with other central banks through the Bank of International Settlements, identified a big new risk, which is bank lending to non-financial institutions like um, hedge funds. Um, they pointed out that there is more of this money <coughs> flowing through the Cayman Islands than there is to Italy. Uh, and all kind of weird and dangerous things are happening. But the present structure is perfectly capable, as, or as capable as anybody can be, of uh, identifying future risk. And if this <coughs> uh, major recession, which we're all worrying about, does happen as a result of protectionism, Brexit, um, all kinds of other things that could happen, some problems in China and so on, are we equipped to deal with it? Well, the obvious problem, which the other speakers have mentioned, is it's difficult to use interest rate policy because short-term interest rates are already close to zero. Uh, Long-term interest rates uh, reflected in the yields on bonds are negative. There's, I think, 17 trillion worth of uh, negative yielding bonds out there in the system. So it's very difficult to use conventional uh, monetary policy or even um, asset purchases in this situation. So what, what else would you do? Well, one, we've already referred to, we need a more aggressive fiscal policy, um, borrowing to invest, we've discussed that, but that's a government <coughs> initiative, it's not down to central banks, but they've got to be coordinated. But the, re the really controversial issue is whether we would, in extremis, have to resort to what's called helicopter money effectively printing money, putting money in the hands of consumers in order to stave off um, the depression. It's, it hasn't happened so far, except a little bit on the margins in Japan. Uh, it could happen here, but if that were to happen, surely we would want the Bank of England to remain independent so it can judge whether that's necessary and how much it's necessary. But the decision of where to spend the money 
these are political questions and should remain very firmly with uh, ministers and parliament. So I, I, I wouldn't argue for a fundamental change in the way monetary policy is conducted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, First of all, welcome to Paul. I think it's uh, very good. Um, I think I am someone who has never been entirely comfortable with the uh, policy to um, completely hand over control or independence to central banks. Um, party, policy, party policy is for the independence of uh, the central bank. But I think with the review that we've commissioned into the role of the Bank of England, it's to give it new powers, partly to um, oversee targets of productivity within the economy and also to ensure, I suppose, for want of a better word, policing of uh, firms on their decarbonisation programmes, which I think is something I haven't heard mentioned on the panel yet about the issue of decarbonisation and the climate crisis. And I think independent central banks, I think the term was used, have a role to play. And obviously our, uh, the government of the Bank of England uh, has been at the forefront of, uh, of discussing pushing forward policies which can move in that direction. I think um, the good thing about this report is that if those two key areas, productivity and decarbonisation, as, as additional roles of the Bank of England uh, are to, to come into play, this will make this one of the most powerful central banks in the world. And I think what this report does shows that there needs to be a far better balance in terms of democratic accountability, because I think I would say over the past 40 years that institutionally with the Bank of England, um, with a range of institutions across the United Kingdom's um, economy, whether they be uh, local economic partnership, uh, sorry, left, so local economic partnerships, there seems to be uh, an erosion of that democratic accountability at the heart of the uh, last 40 years of the economic project. And I think that has come at a price. So I welcome this report because what it's doing is it isn't throwing out the baby with the bathwater. It isn't saying that there isn't a role for a level of independence. I don't think it's as easy to say that politicians, bad, uh, independent central bankers, good. The truth probably lies somewhere uh, in the middle if I'm going to hedge my bets and try and get in slightly. But I think what we do need is greater accountability, less opaqueness within the system. Um, and I think if we have that, then we begin to have a system where you may be able to get a balance um, in the future. Uh, I think the other area of the report that I liked was on the issue of credit guidance, and I think that's something where uh, increasingly the Bank of England uh, helping and directing where finance into the economy and lending goes, I think is going to be critical, because one of the things that I'm very keen on in my role on the shadow front bench is on greater sustainability in the economy. Uh, is this cutting out? Am I okay? Yeah, is that good? Um, and one of the things we can, we understand is that this simply isn't going to be uh, achievable on the scale that's required, in the term scales that are required by simple uh, taxation and fiscal policy. There's also going to have to be a component of, of how we raise that money. And I think if credit guidance is a, is a component of any future Bank of England and increasingly enhancing how that operates, I think that could have a big role to play. Um, what I would conclude on is, I think the uh, sorry, I would just come back onto the other part that I really did like, which was on making the Bank of England in terms of the way that it uh, recruits uh, the MPC, uh, how that is done. I think making that process more transparent, making the people on the MPC reflect and represent uh, a wider cross section of our society, uh, from civil society, trade unions. I think seeing this uh, and central bankers as high priests, uh, technocratic priests of an economic system which very few people understand, has to end. And this is about making our economy more approachable, more understandable by a wider range of people across our society. Because ultimately, unless we can help democratize our economy, give people a sense that this isn't being done to them, the things that are happening to them aren't simply being done to them, that they also have a say in them, whether that's directly, indirectly, or through the democratic accountability process of politicians and others being involved, then I think that's critical for the future. We're seeing at the moment, uh, I would say, uh, uh, 
a malaise within our democracy. There is a, a crisis within democracy. You don't have to go very far. You'll look this week and see what happens in Parliament. You'll see there is a crisis in democracy. I don't think it's terminal, but we have to make sure that we make the right and correct decisions and policy choices, and that means that people uh, have to feel involved in that process. And I think this institution, so important, so large, um, so crucial to our economy, making sure that we can make it as accountable, as democratic and as transparent as possible, is the right way forward. And I think that this goes some way into achieving that. Thank you. So this isn't really a question, but more an observation, is that with globalisation, we have enfranchised the very bottom of society in the far-flung reaches of the world. And possibly, lack of demand at the global level is to do with the completely fractured, fizzled out lack of any demand in our European sense for goods, services, or whatever. This is just an observation. Thank you. Hello, my name is Prashant Zaya. I work in the Climate Bonds Initiative. Um, last week, we released a report on uh, green environmental systems to central banks. Um, how much uh, agreement with comments in the uh, table made? Uh, if anything, central banks have been rather good at what they've been doing, and we stuck to their agenda. So much so that um, a few years ago, Mark Carney, the representative from the Big Bank of China, set forward a critical uh, green financial systems. And, you know, so far, you know, central banks invented quantitative easing in Japan, then it was copied in uh, the years of the Really interesting. Um, is really um, quantitative easing. The, the problem has been it's been too much focused on um, this idea of market neutrality. So governments, uh, so central banks have ended up in the UK buying half a trillion pounds worth of assets, that's the uh, GDP. Same in Eurozone, about four trillion euros of assets. Market neutrality has meant uh, government bonds, and bonds issued by large companies like um, mortgage banks oil and gas. I welcome the idea of um, having outside people in because they have a more political, maybe don't use the mic, just stand up and kind of speak loudly because they finish up is to make it quite succinct. I think perhaps we need two things to happen. One is that uh, more kind of um, um, care is used in the, in the purchase of uh, positive using. We very much advocate for uh, central banks decide these are assets that are at risk of being stranded, particularly oil and gas, electricity company, corporate bonds, and stop buying these and give them a, a large haircut. Secondly, um, the selective and try to buy more green assets, which there aren't enough of yet, but if they create a demand, they will rise. And I'm very interested in this idea of uh, credit guidance policy. This is still being used in India, in China, in Malaysia, where um, the banks are actually selectively going out and lending money for central banks telling uh, banks to lend to agriculture sector, SMEs, um, schedule classes in India. So um, that would be something where um, <coughs> sort of understanding why, why the diverse group of governments might have an impact. But we do need technology, and the banking is doing a great job, I think. Great. Just to clarify, that was just a comment, right? There wasn't yeah. a question in there. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was a question. What do you think about um, the, the governments uh, essentially the point to something more? Um, so market. Uh, I'm not going to rely on this much. Uh, 
I think if you just look at the six points at the bottom of page six, they're unarguable, they're very straightforward, and there's no great dilemma here. I'd like to refer people back to a wonderful comment by um, Martin Wolf in about 2013-14, saying the British banking and financial system is an enterprise to leverage up asset prices in which the Bank of England has been complicit. And I'm split about this. Uh, my mum's uh, nursing home part moved from just under um, 100,000 in 2001 to about 350,000 in 2014, just before she went in, thanks to cognitive easing. On the other hand, I have to share my house with a 30-year-old son, whereas I was able to buy a four-bedroom house in Ealing for 14,250 in 1977, uh, now on super for 800k. Uh, so a lot of my generation think they're doing very well, while the younger generation waits for them to keel over. And currently, banking seems to be and, to, and the financial system seems to continue to create this um, mirage. Uh, if you look at the, the link between land ownership, land inflation prices, we've got an acre for everybody in the country, virtually. It costs £100,000 to build uh, an average semi-detached. We put an number 2 million or one twentieth of 1% of the land in the country, and it would cost about a quarter of what the Bank of England has created in uh, quantitative easing. Quantitative easing, would you accept the mistake that you made? Thank you very much for our inter generational inequality. Um, so, well, perhaps we can start with you on corporate bond purchase schemes and market oh, neutrality, sure. and you can explain a bit about what happened. What happened? Okay, um, yeah, thank you very much. All the question, uh, all the people who asked questions. Um, it's great to hear people talking in this event about uh, climate change and decarbonisation and linking that. And I would um, refer anybody who's really interested in how that might interact um, to a report that came out last year with Total Money um, called the Green Bank of England, where we were looking at um, precisely that question. Um, I would agree with you that uh, this kind of initiative that's been shown and, and searching for new answers to problems that um, are very much of the contemporary time is is welcome and is demonstrates great thinking from these individuals. I think, um, look, with, with, with kind of the regulation that's come out after the financial crisis to manage the financial risks, but then also the, the movements that we're seeing um, with regard to climate change and then bond purchases in, again, it's um, concerned stabilizing the economy, but also now this question of um, addressing climate uh, decarbonisation. It's just really clear that central banks are being uh, are moving towards doing more and more and more. That's just what's happening. Um, so macroprudential regulation is actually, this is, sorry, a jargony term for the um, watching out for systemic risks across the whole economy, um, which was very much the, the new mode of regulating following the crisis. Um, in many ways, that actually looks quite a lot like credit guidance could look, really, in that it's, it identifies particular types of institutions that might be especially risky um, and identifies types of um, patterns of lending that we ought to avoid, um, but it doesn't go the whole distance. And, and because we're trapped in this, it, this situation that um, it's gone, but um, that he so rightly identified where we're, we've got a um, blame passing agenda, but from both institutions, the Treasury on the one hand and the central bank on the other, um, we never go the whole distance and, and we're never happy to say, okay, it's, these are actually the goals we want to achieve, decarbonisation or um, an improvement of lending to certain areas. Um, we never go that distance, we just let the, the bank um, or indeed other central banks that are, that are um, involved in the network for greening and financial system, it, across the world this, this, this dilemma is happening where these institutions are coming under a lot of pressure um, on the on on one side, from people who don't want things to, um, they see it, this as like mission creep. There's a massive expansion of power. And from, on the other side, from people who um, people who want them to go <laughs> go further. And so that's exactly what we're we're trying to address. Really, is um, to make sure that when these when these new uh, phases 
start, and or they, they've already started, but when we get deep into these new phases of um, that when the central bank continues to buy bonds and that the, the, there's a mechanism for saying how can we make sure that it's not buying fossil fuel company bonds which it is as well um, <laughs> and and exactly that that situation of um, passing the blame is what we, we see with the corporate bond purchases where um, our, ourselves and other groups that have tried to address the decarbonization as it, as it pertains to the bank um, we said, no, you really oughtn't to use a corporate bond scheme to buy any fossil fuel <coughs> bonds because that's just you're just inflating a stranded asset, for instance. That's a terrible idea. And they say, hey, we're market neutral. Don't don't get it us. Like it's nowhere near our job to go into the market and say that uh, fossil fuel bonds aren't a good idea. Um, so we really need to break that deadlock. That's just that's a, a bad situation that we've got ourselves into. Um, and it's totally right that Treasury just doesn't want to have anything to do with it. I think that's starting to change because it's the risks of of avoiding it or the costs of doing nothing are rising so high compared to the, um, the kind of political cost of doing something. But um, we're hoping we get a bit further. Thanks, Rob. Um, does anyone else want to pick up on that point or intergenerational inequality or the first question around globalisation and lack of demand? Any comments? I, I just on the sorry, just on the lack of demand. I would say, what kind of demand are we talking about? And uh, I think that will, I think increasingly some of the old language. And some of the old policy objectives of stimulating demand for its own for its own sake, but for the economic reasons that it can it can have in terms of its impact on the economy. I think we're now moving into an era where resources um, are finite, uh, growth is finite. Um, I think in terms of you know we're approaching nine billion people, maybe more by 2050. Um, there simply isn't enough planet for the lifestyles that that we in the in the developed world currently have for everyone. So that means. Doesn't mean we suppress what they do and change and, and have, keep on doing what we do. That means that we all have to change and move on to a more sustainable footing. So when we talk about um, demand side economics, then I think we have to talk. We have to insert sustainable demand and what is it that we're demanding. Um, I think that's now an increasing part of the narrative that politicians and economists are picking up on, but not fast enough. Um, we just don't think um, that that's something that's necessarily uh, on, on everyone's uh, agenda. At the Thanks, guys. Yes, I, I just worry that, that we're muddling a lot of different issues. I mean, th there are a whole lot of issues that politicians have to do come to grips with. Um, Subcontracting these problems to the agencies like <coughs> um, the Bank of England is just a scare cost. I mean, uh, a classic example is this um, problem with fossil fuel companies. I mean, if we're really serious about global warming, I and mean, there are a whole lot of things we've got to do, like, you know, taxing motorists and other things that aren't very popular, but, you know, politicians are going to do it. Uh, and if there is a high risk attached to um, the assets of oil companies, uh, then pension funds and the rest of them who hold those companies' assets have got their whole body of reserve against that risk. But trying to manipulate, um, using the Bank of England to sort of manipulate policy, seems to me to be completely perverse. I mean, just to take one example, when I was in government, uh, one of the things we were desperately keen to do was to get more lending to small business. And I, I went actually to uh, Irvin King and said, well, instead of buying all these uh, bonds from big corporates, why don't you buy bundles of loans um, from to small business? And his answer was, well, you know, I think it's a great idea, but nothing to do with me. Um, if you want to lend money to small business, use taxpayers' money and set up a business bank, which is actually what we did. Um, but he was quite right, actually. This is it's a political question, and it involves uh, fiscal policy and the use of public funds. And saying, you know, it's, it's the job of the Bank of England to deal with all these complicated and difficult issues. Uh, it's, it's completely directing the conversation in the wrong direction. Can I ask you a quick question? Because yeah. I, I guess what muddied the water was this 10 billion corporate bond purchase scheme. If you were being Chancellor, would you have said, that's not allowed, you've only got to, you're only allowed to buy government bonds? Yeah, so well, I, I would have stuck to a narrow definition. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Um, Catherine, do you want to say something about the housing, intergenerational inequality? I just wanted to talk about the different products which were available at the time after the crash and I was a borough leader at the time and you know we were just so desperate to build more um, social homes because we knew it was a really good investment for 
because over a long period of time, a building cost of even in an expensive London borough at that point about one hundred and ten to one hundred and twenty thousand to build a home, <coughs> which over ten years at, at a third of market rent you can pay back depending on the size of the property. But um, then the government went towards the help to buy scheme, which is putting money in people's pockets, and I completely understand the politics of that. But I just feel, in terms of the capital investment, we just could have been so much further down where we need to be now, um, rather than still just feeling as though, in the end, so much of that money went to the developers. Um, and property developers have made an absolute killing, when we still really haven't made any progress on, the, on you know, younger people getting onto the property market. So, you know, I feel in terms of the products which government decide on, um, help to buy, I think, has been a failure. Um, <laughs> And I really hope that we can do some more convincing on just the capital needed to put into really high quality social housing stock. You can always use it in an emergency. <coughs> and I think probably an emergency and a recession is where we're headed now. Without wanting to depress everybody in this morning. Robert, would you like to comment on any of those questions? Well, I <coughs> no, that, Yeah, should that, take a couple? Are you going to have another round? Yeah, yeah, and I'll come to you first. I'll, I'll wait. Yeah. Great. So there's. Uh, Rod, yellow jumper, and is there one more on this side of the room? What about? Yeah. I've heard you ask a great question before. <laughs> yeah, we we'll start with you. Uh, uh, Rod Dowler, from the Industry Forum. It does seem to me that if we get the level of investment that I think Clive thinks <coughs> we need, and which Bernie Sanders thinks might be like 8% of GDP over 10 years in decarbonisation, um, we have got to find some new way of financing that. It does seem to me if we did that, it might have the same <coughs> beneficial effect uh, that um, FDR's New Deal and, and actually the Second World War had in getting the US um, economy out of recession um, after the big recession in 1928. Now, I can't seem to convince anyone <laughs> of these beneficial effects. So how, how do we change the attitude of politicians and economists to see that this could actually avert what I think is a, is a coming world slowdown and possibly recession. Thank you. Uh, hello. Mark, uh, shall I give the mic? Uh, no. Yeah, no, just stand yeah, up. Hi, uh, Mark, I'm really a citizen. Um, <laughs> uh, Clive alluded to the reasons why, but surely um, when the lady here referred to the Indian subcontinent, um, 10 years ago, the bulk of that population were living sustainably until they were enslaved into the money go round by uh, President Modi's providing them with coal fired electricity that they had to then earn money to pay for. Is the economy sustainable at all? Or rather, I suggest it's the antithesis. <laughs> you don't want to stand in a cage, um, so yeah, I just wondered if you could bring in the younger generation. Do you, do you have any questions? I'm not really. Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think looking at the future of credit policy with how the housing market will probably become harder and harder to access, do you think that with, because what we've seen is that uh, creditors have a lots of control over monetary policy over the years um, because creditors have been sort of um, led by lots of big uh, class individuals who always have lots of capital incomes. Do you think the independence of the Bank of England there with credit policy, I should, I should have thought through phrasing this, it's, it's, okay. it's something I wrote, that was that back in my head. Do you think that our credit policy do you think that things like citizens' assemblies and things like that could work well to work to build a new settlement for the Bank of England? Or do you think that we should complete, keep it completely independent and only keep it entirely in the world? Thank you so much. Should we start with you, Robert? Yeah. And uh, okay. you, Robert? Well, I think that, you know, I, I'll, I'll respond to certainly the first question where you say that um, it's been very hard for you to persuade anyone to make these investments in, and, and I agree, green, green energy ought to be really rough at the top of it. The point is, though, you have to get beyond why is it so hard to persuade people. Mm. And 
the, the answer is that um, most economists don't believe you have to have any, any public investment yeah. at all. I mean, the, the, why, doesn't the pri why doesn't the market do whatever is necessary and arrange, and arrange a structure relative to prices? That will simply um, um, favour uh, favour um, uh, a green, green project. Now, uh, uh, that was behind the privatisation policies of the 1980s and 90s. There was a very very large public investment going on in 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 in, in, the, in the 70s, and most of that most of that um, was discontinued, and the ratio of public investment to total investment has collapsed, and that was a result of ideology. Um, and it was a result of ideology, ideologically driven economic theory. Unless you sort of get at that, you're going to be killed every time you know you say this. And Vince, Vince's uh, business bank is an example. It's a great initiative. Are you still there, Vince? I can't see you you know, behind, behind. Yeah, but you know it was very small and it was very, 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 very limited. And they didn't basically believe in. It was a sop to the Lib Dems, really. Um, they didn't believe in it. They didn't believe that it was necessary. So unless you get at the theory behind it, you're always going to be a stymie. That's point one. Point two, why does one think that democratizing an institution is going to make it more radical? I mean, the Labour Party, um, would, you know, it, once it started competing for power, and its appointees started to become ministers and officials. Labour, Labour Party financial policy was incredibly conservative all the way uh, really through. Um, and I, I, I you know, I'm a historian as well, as dabbling in economics, and I know the history of it. So I, I'm, I'm not sure that's the panacea um, to our problems, the solution to our problems. <coughs> Thank you. Rob, I wonder if you could pick up on the um, cities and assemblies, because we talk a bit about the um, yeah, getting citizens involved. Yeah. yeah, thank you. That's um, a great question. Um, yeah, I think I want to relate it to um, uh, sort of Vince's objections, actually, um, in that really, it, by talking about citizens' assemblies and, and, and that phrase as a, um, it's become quite symbolic for sort of the idea of a much more participatory politics, um, I think that gets at what's at stake here, which is not just that there is a major economic set of economic difficulties, and though it's obviously tempting to, to always drift back into talking about that, um, really, the central bank is, is part of our politics, and it's an immensely political institution. And so, and it's political because the, the trade-off between inflation and unemployment that it's supposedly set up to, to manage um, in a supposedly neutral manner is not, in fact, neutral at all, really, even if the trade-off is, is itself simple and, and manageable, which it's, it's not in the current present circumstances. Um, but it's political because of the different values that those, those um, macroeconomic factors represent. But then it's also just by virtue of being a, an, an enormous, powerful institution and the way we see drift in these, in these matters and um, capture by, by powerful interests just over time, almost as just an inevitability um, especially when hyped off from democratic politics, that's that's why it's so political. So therefore, it's not just about trying to design um, monetary policy and financial <laughs> policy, or whatever wrapper you want to call it, all that. So the, all the things that the bank addresses. It's not just about trying to design those so that they manage the economy better. It's it's looking at this as what it is, which is also something that governs all of our collective lives, and that we all have a stake in, and that. It, Really, it's. I mean, it's. It's not even enough to say. Oh, the average person doesn't know what quantitative easing is. Ian said it. The average MP doesn't know what quantitative easing is. It's. It's an unbelievable separation from politics of these enormously important things. And so, citizens' assemblies. Um, yes, I think it's quite difficult to see because it's just such a fledgling idea. It's difficult to see how um, it will be linked to such an arcane technocratic institution. But the panels are a really, really interesting um, initiative because just because of the, the link between these people who are otherwise completely isolated from not the sort of regular society to people who in, in towns around the UK who are 
feeling the effects of these policies. Just that building that link at all is, I think, incredibly important. And then we imagine that um, the effect of building greater trust and understanding over time, that that feeling of participation, that itself is, is valuable, but that itself can also lead to um, reviving the, the, the links between the actual democratic parliamentary institutions, the central bank itself, and the monetary institutions that we're talking about here, and people themselves. Because those links have just withered so, so much, and no one really understands the other, which is, I think, the, the characterizes the, the quite dire situation we're in today. Um, it's not just about the economics. Um, the economics, may, yeah, maybe it's been working, but it hasn't actually been working that well. But certainly what's not working is the, our, our sort of collective political existence. And uh, yeah, I think so. Thank you for raising citizens' assemblies, because that's a, probably a better phrase. Than, uh... Great, thank you, Rob. Do you have any comments, Vince, that you want to pick up on? Um, also, there was a middle question. No, I just was going to add the slightly pertinent point that you know, people in India was was never a sustainable. Uh, Have you ever been there? Yeah, you know, many times. I've not seen them living hand to mouth for fifty years, but you know, people were hungry. You know, it, it's mm. now it, India is now becoming a middle income country. You now yeah, they're starving. Well, they were. The much fewer numbers are starving now than they were. I don't think it's a very unequal country, but it's now in a much better place than it was 10 or 20 years ago. You'll be moving to Clive. I might be as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just think picking up on the on the India question, for me, the issue for countries like India or countries further behind India in terms of development is how, and I mean, we are slightly on topic here, I'll, I'll say it anyway, but it's, it's, it's how do we help them make the jump over that kind of 30, 20th century phase of the economy in the 21st. And I think that's where um, countries like our own have a real role to play. Because if we are going to develop decarbonizing strategies, know-how technologies, then those are things that we are going to have to seriously consider if we are to, to make it through the coming century on how we're going to share those technologies, uh, not necessarily trade them with them, but actually potentially give them away at <coughs> cost price because I think um, ultimately if we don't do that, if we don't help these developing countries to make the jump from where they are now to a more sustainable uh, situation, then we're all, we're all going to head in a handcuff. It doesn't make sense what we do in this country if billions of people around the world are, are using coal-fired power stations and so on. So that's a, a big challenge for the developing, for the developing world uh, and something I don't think is actually looked at in enough detail. Um, I think in terms of... Um, Citizens' assemblies. I think that there's a there's a fantastic role for them to interface. I think you made the point really clear. You know, quantitative easing. Most politicians don't know what quantitative easing is. Uh, in, so making as an interface between uh, vast institutions, which are using an extremely complex, detailed policy <coughs> mechanism, which affects all of our lives, and interfacing that with the rest of the public. I think that's a democratic necessity. Um, and I think holding having these institutions behind closed doors. Arcane high priests of the economy isn't the way forward, and I think that undermines how our democracy works. Especially if some of the decisions made have an adverse impact on yourself and your community. So I think it's just the basic of democracy that there is that interface there. And I guess the question I would ask myself is, you know, do I think all central bankers are independent or central banks are independent? Well, do I think all journalists are impartial? Um, impartial journalists just don't exist. It's, uh, it's something you strive for. They may well strive for, bankers may well strive for independence, but there are institutional bias inbuilt into the system. We know that. Um, some of the policy mechanisms that are being used, the point as this document highlights, the distributional impact, you know, it's actually it's actually hunkered down on growing inequality within our economy, some of the some of the some of the quantitative easing that's taken place. So I, I personally think in terms of the opportunity for citizens assemblies to be able to impact that interface and influence how uh, these central banks work and who they're working for, I think is critical because I think what we can see is that the financial system that we have, whilst it does have some strengths, it has many flaws. And unless I've had my head in the sand, it feels to me that we're heading towards another financial uh, unstable period of potential crash as so many, many observers are now saying. So it's really critical that we have as much of a say as possible <coughs> policies uh, and 
and institutions which are uh, enacting that. Thank you so much. Just before Fran winds up finally, just to thank everybody for coming and very pleased to sponsor today's event. But just to say also that, you know, even what we're going to be debating today around, you know, educating MPs about decisions that we're about to take is a very big decision between these different deals on Brexit, mm. for example. And yet, you know, the Chancellor is refusing to give us the information between what's sort of being proposed compared to say what Mrs May proposed compared to say what Keir Starmer would propose. There's two or three percentage different point in all of those in terms of the impact on GDP. Now, we might sort of want to relativise that and say, well, we don't know. There's lots of, but at least you can't educate MPs unless they have access to information. Um, and I think even the Treasury Select Committee is going to struggle to get the requisite information out of our own government. And we have a pretty, you know, robust system. We have, you know, a chair of our parliament who really wants to get that information and help us. But governments have got to, you know, really be held to account as particularly governments where there's no overall control um, and, you know, where people aren't necessarily elected to take the decisions that they're trying to push through a parliament. So. I would just say that, um, you know, with the best will of the world, sometimes it's really difficult to get that information and to get yourself educated as an MP. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks so much for hosting. Um, we've covered a huge amount of, of conversation on the UK economy, to make, how we need to um, really challenge mainstream economics, which Rob brought up, which is a really important point to how we decarbonise. <coughs> and I think hopefully some of this discussion got us some way towards what we think a new settlement for the Bank of England might look like. Um, I want to f thank our fantastic panellists. They've been you know, really great in terms of the insights they've brought. Uh, obviously, Ian can stay. And obviously, thank you all for coming. Um, do grab a copy of our, our report on your way out. And um, thanks.